Well, welcome to another motivational interview. I'm Wayne Kelly, and today I'm really pleased to have a friend of mine, Mr. Tony Dyson, as our featured expert. And Tony is the guy who is behind the creating of the R2-D2. He's worked with, well, the Star Wars project. He's worked with Superman. He's worked with The Who, and he's worked with a ton of other big names in the industry. So it's a pleasure to have Mr. Tony Dyson on the show. Hi, Tony. Whee! <laughs> Hi, Wayne. <laughs> How great to have you on here. What a great send-up. Oh, is that a send-up? not quite right. But anyway, introduction, <laughs> introduction. <laughs> so, Tony, you and I have uh, had so many great conversations that I really thought that you'd be the perfect guy to just, you know, share some success, success secrets with. I've got to be careful how I say that, by the way. <laughs> I, you, you just have, I love your story. Now, let's go back. We're going to go back to, you know, when you had this interest of, of working with robots, you were a child in the UK. How did you get into the film industry? Oh, well, <laughs> the first thing is I was like all of the ch- kids. I loved the idea of robots, right? So that was a kind of um, a thing I liked as well as Superman, as well as all the comic book robots just seemed really cool because they could make a great friend. You could give them orders to tell them what to do. I mean, it was a perfect situation, but I never dreamed for one minute I'd ever actually build them. You know, I mean, it just yeah. it didn't seem possible. Um, the real love I had at the time was the film industry. I mean, it was making films, seeing films. Um, my sister and I used to go to a thing called the Saturday Morning Miners in the UK, which basically was an excuse to get the kids out of the house on a Saturday morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it really was, you know. But to me, it hooked me. I mean, I was totally hooked. I mean, wow, was I hooked. Hollywood, wow, wow, wow. Um, and so when I got a little older, not much older, but a little older, about 18, um, I remember my sister was working at the telephone exchange. Now, in them days, and this is like before steam, um, the, the, the operator used to actually get the number for you. Okay. And I'm sure lots of people haven't got the fuckest idea what I'm talking about, but you would actually dial the operator and they would get the number and say, you're through, sir. Well, my sister did that job. I mean, she was working away from home one weekend and my parents were away as well. And she rang me up and said, Tony, Tony, I found out where Pinewood Studios is. Well, we knew it was you know the big man with the gong, which was rank, which was Pinewood, same thing. And we had no idea where it was. I mean, it's just like somewhere in the ether. But she knew it was just outside London, and she gave me directions. So I hopped on my, in those days, I used to have a scooter, by the way. I wasn't a, quite a mod, but close to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't really want to go with the rough boys, you know what I mean? Right, right. A, a mummy's boy type of thing. <laughs> so I get on my scooter, right, and I'm going down the motorway. And I turned off where she said, and I've got this little map, and I get to there, and it, it's actually... Pinewood Studios in a Pinewood Wood. That's why it's called Pinewood. Mm-hmm. City boy, wasn't I? And yeah. it was gorgeous. There's this great big gate. And there's, there's this policeman at the front there, and the guard, and I drove up there on my scooter. You can imagine what he was thinking, can't you? And I said, I, I, I want a job. He said, got an appointment? Uh, no. Well, piss off then. No, no, please. I, I'll, I'll do anything. You know, <laughs> sweep the floors. I'll do anything, you know. And you're pitching, it, you're pitching yourself to the guy at the gate. Oh, yeah. He won't let me through. He won't let me through. I mean, okay. how dare he not let yeah. me through? Okay. It's like, it's like I always tell when I tell people, you know, Hollywood needs you. They just don't know it yet. Yeah. Well, it's okay. the same situation. They didn't know they needed me, but they did. They did. They did. Okay. Anyway, he told me to get lost, and I went off, and it, the gods cried for me, and the storm came down. I came off my bike, and I got wet through, and it was miserable. So that was my little experience to start with. But years later, when I was about 21, um, I, I didn't want to give up this idea, you know, even though he told me I should do this car at the gate. So I rang up the studios instead of going down there on a bike. I was married by then, by the way. And I rang up all the studios saying, could I do this? Could I? And I couldn't even get past the telephone exchange. Again, the same kind of guard. It must have been the sister of the guard I was talking to before. I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, you know, there's no way would they let you past. And I was ringing a smaller studio because I started at the top and worked down. And this studio called Bray Studio. And that's the studio where they used to make all the horror hammer films. You remember those Mm -hmm. vampires and that kind of thing. Well, they made all, well, they made them there. And so I rang them up and I think I I rang for about two days nonstop. And the woman at the end, and the same woman on the same shift, I think, (laughs) I I felt really sorry for her. And she kept saying, what do you want? Go up, I went, no, go up, pick up. And so at the end, she she really felt sorry for me. She said, I'll put you through to the special effects department. 
Well, I had no idea what the special effects department was. So anyway, I got through there, and someone picked it up. It was a tea break or something. <laughs> and this guy says, what do you want? So I told him, well, I would like to work at the studios, blah, 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 blah. And he said, well, you might be in luck. Well, you can imagine my heart jumped straight through my mouth. And I'm going, uh, buh, buh, buh. So we talked about, have you got a license? Have you got a green card? Uh, no, I said, I haven't got a green card. It's a union card. I said, how do you get one? He said, we have to work on a film. I said, <laughs> <laughs> you know what's coming, yeah, don't you? Yeah. You know what's coming. So we went through this little game, like a bit of a waltz, you know, got to work on a film to get a green card. Can't get a green card, can't work on a film. And he said, oh, don't worry about it, Tony. I said, what do you mean don't worry about it? We just had half an hour about, you know, I need a yeah. green card. He said, well, this is special effect department. I said, what is special effect department? So it's a very new department, and it's set up for films to do all the special effects in the film. But it'll be, you know, model making would be in it, right? Blue screens, glass screens, um, everything you can think of that actually makes a special effect, including pyrotechnics and stuntmen. So I said, wow, that's pretty exciting. He said, well, it's coming to fashion now. And the directors can't take care of it all. You know, they have to talk to each department, the makeup, the special effects makeup, and the special hair, and all the rest of it, and it's just getting them down. So what they decide to do, in, anyway, in UK, is to have one director in charge of all these departments, and then he's responsible to the film director. Mm -hmm. I said, wow, that sounds cool. He said, but there's one problem. Not for you, but for the studio. They can't get enough people to do this work. There's just so many jobs needed to do in with model making and design work and everything else. He said, so what they're doing is they're bringing outsiders in. He said, guess what? I was working in a model studio, a model shop in, in Windsor two weeks ago. Wow. Uh, what? Yeah. So that's what it turns out. He's a model maker. Well, he actually knew a lot about models and helicopters particularly. And they didn't know anything about helicopters for the films, model ones. So they actually brought him in and gave him a job. Wow. And he didn't have a license. Yeah. He didn't have a green just gave him a job. So he said, that's what you want to get into, Tony. You want to get into the special effects department. So that was it. That was my first break. So I rung back again. He gave me a name, by the way, Brian Johnson. So the woman at the telephone says the following day, hello. I think she recognized my voice. I said, oh, good afternoon. Could I possibly talk to Brian Johnson, please? Certainly I'll put you through. Oh, <laughs> I had a name, I had a name, I had a name. <laughs> so I get this wonderful, isn't it? I get through to Brian Johnson. I told him that uh, I would, and I could do this, I could do that, which wasn't really quite true, but I had the info from this guy. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I wanted to go for special effects, and he's in charge of special effects. He's one of the new directors. So he said, oh, yeah, okay, we're always looking for talent. Uh, bring something you've made and come down on Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't make models. I didn't make those things that all the other kids made. Well, the things I made were out of cardboard and toilet roll. I mean, that's the kind of thing, you know. <laughs> Not there, yeah. good stuff. So the ray guns are the kind of thing I made. But at the time, I was actually making a rocking horse in, in fiberglass, GPR. And I was really making it in my shed, and it wasn't painted. And I didn't have a spray booth. And I was trying to figure out how to paint it. And here he is. He's saying, you, you know, I'll have you. I'll probably get to work with you if you can show me what you can do. So for a whole week from that phone call, I started painting it black and tipping it from one foot to another because it's quite a big one, you know? yeah. <laughs> a big rocking yeah. horse. So it, it turned out that I just tipped it and let the paint drain because I didn't have a spray booth. Eventually, <laughs> after working night and day, I must have looked like, oh, God, I'm as bad. Black, black eyes and his my eyes. Yeah. I took that down to the studio and it turned out he loved it so much, he was my first client. Wow. Yeah, and, and and the rest is history for you. Then you got into every everything else that you've been doing. You're a lifelong yeah. career. That's right. He told me how to get to the studio, take the second gate, not the first gate. After all those years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the wow. first film was James Bond. The first one was James Bond. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Which which James Bond movie? Moonraker. Wow. Yeah. Went down there, saw the guy that Brian Johnson told me about. And uh, he gave me all the models in, in Moonraker, space models. Wow. <laughs> so I said, yes, 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 walked away and went, how the hell do I make these? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a fascinating story. And it's all about you You kept at it. You had the dream. You wanted to do it. And you, you were persistent. How many of us yep. just give up now? I mean, you, everything you're talking about, do you still use? Say again? Everything that you're talking about. Do you, do you still use when you want to when you want something? 
Yeah, they, they carried on the same way. I mean, later on, I got myself um, a small studio. I was always outside of the studios. So I had my own, like, uh, a workshop and, and a building is, on, on a uh, business site. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'd have, let's say, two people working for me in the beginning. Mm-hmm. But when someone came down, let's say, the Who group, for example, yeah? Yeah, the Who, yeah. But they, yeah, I was moving into all the kind of fields after a while. This is jumping a few a few years. But just to give you an example where you use the same principles. And I only had two people excuse me, in the studio at the time, and we had to do the special effects for the last big concert, which turned out not to be the last one, but they thought it was going to be the last one. Okay. <laughs> we are doing this big flash and burned down a screen with lasers. This was a special effect I was doing for them. Um, and when they came down, I thought, well, they're not going to be really impressed with three guys in a very large room. It was a very big studio at the time. So what I did is I went to all the other buildings, and it was rent-a-crowd. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to all the workers in all the other buildings, gave them a white coat, told them to polish a mold of some sort. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it looked great. Yeah. I mean, it looked great when they walked in. Very impressive. Wow. You have to move what people expect to see. You know, as long as you know you can do the job. Yeah. You know, I don't put forward that people should cheat in any way. Right. But what I do put forward is that often you have to provide what they think they should see. Because yeah. if you know what you can do, yeah. and of course it worked out. I mean, I succeeded in doing all the jobs. And I never let down one job or one target date ever. But sometimes you have to do that. You know? And that's what I did in that instance. And actually, everybody copied it from there on. Really? Not a the- joke. Everybody on our <laughs> estate, even the guy that was making <laughs> large boats, would go and rent a crowd and we'd all go into his workshop. <laughs> I thought like we were busy when he was getting a contract in. <laughs> Oh, what a great story. I love it. Now, let's let's jump ahead now, 35 years, and let's talk about, you know, what keeps you moving these days? These days, well, as you know, I, I semi-retired when I was 40, okay? Yeah. And I got really, really, really bored. Um, it just wasn't working out for me very <laughs> well at all. So what I did is I decided the best way would be, A, to work a consultant, because I didn't really want to any more the studio. The studio was great when I had it, mm-hmm. but when you're paying 40 people plus another 40 outsiders, um, it gets very expensive. Plus the fact you've got to wait for the right films or the right right theme park to come up, and it can be very aggravating having this long gap in between projects. Sometimes or even a month will cost you fifty thousand. Yeah, just paying the wages out. Wow. Yeah. So you know, I'm quite happy to have given that up when it when I did do, and I achieved a. Uh, a lot before I did give it up. But so I said, retired. Then I decided, well, if I work as consultant, the best idea is to work on the web. So I wanted to learn how to put websites up, how to promote websites. And then all my other projects, which I'm doing now, I've come through the web. Mm-hmm. And, and you're but, still involved in the in the robot world and, and kind of incorporating ro- robots into web, right? Well, yes, and actually, but in two ways. One, I use uh, software robots to promote and help me to promote my websites because I have 15 plus 5 and three servers at yeah. the moment. Wow. So I, they help me as uh, slaves to actually get the links around the web and promote my, uh, my websites. That's the first time, first thing. And the other side of the robot equation is that I still give lectures and teach kids in schools that it's a great um, – business to be in. I mean, it's a great career to take up. Unfortunately, so many parents think they should take up computer work when actually we've got thousands of people in computers these days and they should be looking towards a little bit more futuristic and really robotics is where it's at. Really? Are, are, um, you, are you surprised that we don't have the robots that we thought we might have 25 years ago? Um, I was a bit surprised about five or six years ago but now I'm not. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that is very simply, the media was putting over, we would have those robots in the public place. But when you really think about it, it's so damn expensive. There is no real way everybody's going to have a robot in the home mm-hmm. situation, which is of a real nature. Now, in Korea, they think they will do, and they're promising a robot in every home by 2020. Mm, wow. Those robots, what will they be? We've already got... Uh, carpet cleaners. Yeah, we've already got um, ones that clean your swimming pool. We've got ones that clean the gutter outside. So basically, we've got what we call the Pacific robot. You know, for a particular task, we were always thinking about having something which was more general intelligence. The one I go towards, and nobody seemed to pick it up very strongly at the moment, is towards a software robot in the home. 
you know, the one that works from your computer, greets you when you come in, and only uses small slave to do the rest of the work. Mm. A bit like a house uh, keeper. Yeah. Now, we have the technology. We have the technology. Yes. We have the technology. I've seen a couple of examples. To tell you the truth, I have no idea why every home hasn't got one. I don't get it. Yeah. Because we've got the, the brain power in the computers to do it. Yeah. We've got the linking through the wiring in a house so you don't have to rewire the house. I just no idea why it hasn't caught on. Well, we'll have to, we're going to have to check in uh, in like a year and see exactly where that project is. Tony, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, they want to find out more information, which is the best site to find you? Well, my bio is on TonyDyson.com. All right. Tony, thank you very much. You're welcome, Wayne. One more time, thanks very much to my special guest, Tony Dyson, and you can learn more about him, TonyDyson.com. Dyson.com.